pleased and honored to welcome you back to what is our final plenary session for the National Space Society's 16th International Space Development Conference. And we're very fortunate to have with us today U.S. Representative Dave Weldon, the Vice Chairman of the House Space Subcommittee. Representative Weldon is an Army veteran physician and a 43-year-old Brevard Park County resident. He, his wife Nancy, and their adopted 10-year-old daughter have their home in Palm Bay, Florida, and reside in Arlington, Virginia, when they're in the D.C. area. He was elected to his first political office in November 1994 to serve the 15th Congressional District and re-elected to a second term in 1996. I should point out the 15th District is the one that covers uh, a large part of Brevard County, including the uh, Kennedy Space Center area. Dr. Weldon has worked to balance the federal budget and to promote pro-family policies. He's recognized as a leader in space issues and has fought to bring more local government control back to states and communities. As a practicing physician and Army veteran, his background and expertise have been called upon on numerous occasions in key debates, policy discussions, and leadership positions. He's a nationally recognized leader promoting efforts to give parents more control over their children's education. We go over some of the committee assignments and leadership positions which Dr. Weldon has held in the House since his uh, uh, He currently serves in the House Science Committee and the House Banking and Financial Services Committee. He's Vice Chairman of the Science Committee, Subcommittee on Space and Aeronautics. I think that one was sad. His name changed. It was totally reorganized after the uh, uh, election of 94. That was uh, one of the ones that... Uh, as, a, as I mentioned before, he uh, represents the interests of his constituents of KSC, Patrick Air Force Base, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. He's active on the subcommittee in protecting funding for the space shuttle and space station programs, as well as promoting the interests of the emergency and commercial space sector. On the banking committee, he serves on the financial institutions and consumer credit subcommittee. His sophomore class peers and colleagues chose Dr. Weldon to serve as their representative on the Republican Policy Committee on the Board of Congress. <laughs> I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Dave Weldon. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank the National Space Society for inviting me here. I want to uh, congratulate the local uh, NSS chapter for uh, helping to sponsor this event uh, and for putting together this conference. Uh, I read over the uh, schedule and it looked like a really exciting program. And it's exciting to see uh, space activists not only from around the country but around the world today uh, and to talk about civilization's future in space. The National Space Society is an important part of policy discussions in Washington, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to Charlie Walker, David Brand, and other NSS on behalf of the space program. And the Society's efforts couldn't come at a more important time. Our nation's decision point regarding the space program, one that, that, that is tremendously exciting, yet at the same time, is uncertain. The space program motivates our children and inspires scientists, engineers, and explorers who constantly probe the unknown secrets of our world and the universe. Despite some recent difficulties, NASA is still a symbol of our nation's preeminent scientific leader in the world. Policymakers must decide whether to continue forward with programs like our space station. And a few weeks ago, we got a resounding yes out of the House of Representatives, where more than two thirds voted. Policymakers must also decide whether to maintain stable funding for other other NASA programs. And I have been at the forefront in our that occurs. NASA is making important investments in such programs. Not only is the station of the next generation launch vehicle which will help the U.S. regain market shares in commercial space stations. NASA is also participating in a search for planets outside our solar system and scientific endeavors that probe the boundaries of our knowledge of medicine, science, and engineering. As vice chairman 
of the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, I am committed to ensuring that NASA has the resources it needs to move forward with its mission. My district, which includes the historic Space Coast, just a few minutes to our west, is home to Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center, the busiest space port in the world. Nowhere else can you find such a diverse mix of civil, military, and commercial space activities. It is the home to our nation's space shuttle, and it is the place where the elements of our space station will be integrated and lofted into space. We must continue to invest in the space station. Despite the current difficulties, we must continue to safely and efficiently fly the space shuttle fleet, and we must foster the development of reusable launch vehicles which promise to dramatically lower the cost of getting payloads into orbit. However, we must also balance uh, human spaceflight programs with a robust and ambitious science of unmanned exploration program. I sat transfixed with the rest of the world in the summer of 1994 when Jupiter was bombarded by the shoemaker Levy Comet, bringing the tiny dimensions of our world into a universal perspective. I anxiously await data and future pictures from our recently launched Mars probe, as well as the fascinating story that should emerge from our mission to Saturn later this year. So we need to have a balanced program. Automated probes and robots can serve us well in the initial phases of exploration and to explore where humans will never be able to go. But in order to truly get a sense of the alien world, we have to be there to touch it, to feel it. I support returning to the moon, to stay this time perhaps, and a mission to Mars. Technically, we can do things now, but we must find the political and economic will to make it happen. We must also foster commercial, the commercial space sector. And this is where the decision point I mentioned earlier comes truly, becomes truly I firmly believe the future of exploration in space will depend in a large part on the private sector's role to give every business an opportunity to use space as an economic resource. But we need to take a hard look at how the federal government interacts with our commercial space community and make sure we are not hindering the growth potential. The federal government must encourage this industry to grow and prosper, especially since we as a nation find ourselves in an ever more competitive international marketplace. The private sector and state governments are stepping up to this monumental challenge. We have a booming satellite market looking ahead to the cutting edge constellations of LEO telecommunication satellites. We see commercial space ports emerging from coast to coast, and the federal government is entering innovative public-private uh, partnerships like the X-33 program. We also see wholly private launch service companies that hope to compete with the reusable launch vehicle and the current fleet of expending, expendable vehicles. And I think that that competition should be encouraged. Florida's own state commercial spaceport is only a few months away from beginning its launch operations. And I'm anxious to see users reap the benefits of streamlined and efficient operations. In fact, I am happy to report that the Spaceport Florida Authority recently received its commercial operator's license from the FAA just last week. As a policymaker, there are four key issues I intend to focus on over the next year or so. The first is continued investment in X-33 and the follow-on reusable launch vehicle program. I know that there are many skeptics out there who question the real potential of that program but I am optimistic of its future and its potential. I am also excited about NASA's recent announcement of other new X vehicles, which I think are critical steps as we move forward with advanced commercial and 
civil orbital and suborbital vehicles. The real test of the X-33 program will obviously come when federal investment ends, and it is important for Lockheed Martin to work now with financial and investment community sectors to ensure that transition takes place. Until that time, we must continue to rely on the space shuttle for our space flights, and I want to publicly commend the managers, engineers, and technical support crew of the United Space Alliance for the very smooth transition, and I, I hope for continued success of the current space head mission to, uh, to Mir. The second area <coughs> which I very strong interest is commercial efforts within NASA. There's been a lot of talk at, at NASA over the last several years about ensuring a good working relationship with the commercial sector, and I want to make sure that happens. In particular, I believe NASA needs to take a long, hard look at its own structure now in place to promote commercial. Disagree with my position, 
but I want to ensure that our domestic launch providers weren't being subjected to unfair price competition. I fully understand the satellite community's need for risk and cost reduction by using multiple launch vehicles. And in fact, I think some of the agreements that have been signed have uh, very innovative features and, and they show very forward thinking on the part of the American aerospace community. But I will continue to monitor pri the pricing situation in the international market. And I will continue to work with the US trade representative to make sure they too are monitoring any developments. I will say that I am not as concerned about those countries that are teamed with American aerospace companies because I can't think of a better way to promote free market principles and democratic ideals than working with an American firm. Nonetheless, I will continue to take a very, very strong interest in this area. In part because of the trade agreements, I also want to explore the possibility of opening our domestic spaceports up to foreign launch vehicles. Provided any foreign uh, given launch vehicle uh, meets our national security uh, and safety standards and certainly pricing criteria, I think that domestic spaceports should have the ability to bring those foreign launch vehicles to U.S. soil. Our country offers the most diverse range options and we should take full advantage of that in this very, very competitive international market. Fourth, in the future, I want to track the progress that is made by the Air Force and industry in working out arrangements uh, to use the federal launch sites. The excess capacity policy has been appropriate in the past, but it is not clear the Air Force can adequately support the aggressive launch manifests of the 20th and 21st century using this approach. The government needs to work closely with industry to find a long-term solution to this emerging problem, and we not, must not limit what options are available and what options will be explored. For example, we need to look at the possible scenario that augments the Air Force's involvement more NASA and private sector responsibility for launch site operations. And we need to see what effect that that will have on pricing, insurance, technical support, as well as many other areas. I am also encouraged to see the Air Force work hard to modernize our national launch ranges, which will enable us to better compete in the international market. And that needs to be taken into account in any future planning. But we do need to completely re-examine the way our ranges are offered to commercial launch customers, as well as the way commercial customers use the ranges. The ranges are national resources, of course, and we must never eliminate our ability to use them to support our national security goals. But we must not let that be used as an excuse, as an excuse to fail to develop them for their full economic potential for the future of our nation. Finally, I would like to make a point that is very often overlooked in our annual debate regarding the space program. I support the space program for a variety of reasons, among them the scientific, medical, and economic benefits, as well as international competitiveness, and certainly as a stepping stone for future human exploration solar system. However, I also strongly believe that our civilization's future lies in space. As you look through history, <laughs> as you look through history, civilizations that cease to explore and expand the boundaries cease to exist. They may choose not to explore for a variety of reasons, but the end result is the same. The civilization stagnates and becomes a part of history. Our nation, and in fact the world, is at such a slight threshold. In space lies the future of the human race, and to turn away from that challenge now could set us back 
as much as a century or more. Of course, if we stopped exploring space tomorrow, we probably wouldn't feel the impact immediately. It would be our children and their children who would lose the drive to explore, and with them would be lost a historic opportunity for our nation. As a part of our vision for the future generations, I want Congress and the White House to look beyond the near term and put some serious thought into where our nation needs to be 10, 20, and 50 years from now. I would like to see the United States, either alone or partnered with other countries, establishing a permanent base on the moon that can meet both commercial and scientific One of the most exciting concepts that I have seen in a while is the proposal to establish a lunar-based observatory which would provide astronomical observations that are an order of magnitude better than anything we have today. And I want policymakers to look seriously at the concepts like space-based solar-powered satellites that can train <laughs> I know you had a presentation earlier in the conference on that. I think that is one of the most exciting opportunities for commercialization of space. Before I close, I also want to quickly touch on a bigger debate in Washington that directly affects our space program, both civil and commercial, although many people rarely, rarely think of it in that context. The foremost reality that all space program supporters must face is our staggering national debt. Mindless deficit spending by both Democrats and Republicans alike has left our nation in a fiscal crisis. The national drive to balance the budget is not political rhetoric, it is imperative. Fortunately, as a result of the 104th Congress, that has become a national agenda. The challenge facing our commercial and civil space program community, then, is to work within the constraints of this new fiscal reality and to provide a clear rationale for investment in our space program to both new and returning members of Congress. We must ensure that every member of Congress sees the space program in the context of an investment in the future, not just pork for back home. This realization should help to reinforce to the space community the need for true commercial efforts with little or no government involvement, more so than quasi-commercial efforts that are little more than government contracts. I strongly support the efforts to balance the budget, and I will continue to work toward that goal in the 105th Congress. It is crucial to balance the budget if we expect to see any significant sustained investment in science and technology. However, I also believe that today's wise investment in our space program does not have to suffer as we get our fiscal house in order. In fact, I have made increased funding for NASA and other components of our space program one of my top priorities for this legislative session. Space policy has not consistently been a top priority for Congress or for the White House, yet the next few years may prove to be, de be the defining moments for our space program. Both the public and the private sector must learn to work smarter and harder with less resources must do a better job of informing the public of our achievements. It will take a strong coalition of space supporters to ensure a strong and viable space program. And I look forward to working with other members of Congress, the administration, state governments, industry, and organizations like the National Space Society as we confront the challenges facing our space program. Working together, we can ensure that our nation's space program, as well as the future of man in space, continues to move on ahead of the future. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to address you.
here uh, very much want a space program that goes somewhere. And I'm very pleased to hear your support for Return to the Moon to Stay, uh, for the beginning of exploration of Mars, and for solar power satellites. But I don't believe I've seen any of these programs being proposed in the current Congress, so I'd like to ask you, are you prepared to propose or support any of those programs in this coming Congress? We are looking very closely at making a serious proposal like that. Um, one of the reasons I talked about balancing the budget is when I got to Congress and started talking about going back to the moon or Mars, it, to, to put it mildly, it was not very enthusiastically received at all. Um, and I, I brought up balancing the budget for a reason. It is foolish to propose that we're going to get a major investment for a, a Mars mission or a return to the moon uh, when we have $200 billion annual deficits, uh, when we have a $5 trillion debt. Now, what's going on right now is very encouraging. We got the deficit in, 90, uh, in 96 uh, down to about $117 billion. This fiscal year, it's looking like it's going to get down to about $70 billion. And we, our strategy when I came into Congress, in, in, when I was elected in 94, I got sworn in in 95, was to have the budget balance by 2002. Well, with the economy doing well, we may have to balance actually sooner. And what will happen when we get to a balanced budget is there will be a very, very intense competition for, uh, for dollars. And there will be those people who want to invest in more social programs. There will be those people who want to pay off the deficit or the national debt, excuse me. Um, and, and right now, the interest on that $5 trillion is about $350 billion a year. Okay, so we could, we could go to Mars every year and, uh, with that kind of money. I mean, if we had, if we had made the right decisions, Eighties and not grown up this huge uh, debt. And by the way, just, just to give you some historical perspective, this was never done in our nation's history before, except in times of war. Uh, we, we went into debt in the Revolution, the War of eighteen twelve, the Civil War, World War One, World War Two, and never did our nation ever go into debt uh, like we have in the past fifteen years. Um, the, the competition will be intense, as I was saying, once we have a balanced budget. So I think it's very important, anticipating that, that people like myself and all of you in this room start moving ahead now on a return moon mission, on a, on a mission to Mars, and putting together credible proposals so that it will be in the debate early, so that when the budget is balanced and start talking about serious renewed investment in science and technology, these proposals are on the table. Question back in the return. Uh, yes. Um, since we still have a problem with the money, uh, what about the possibility of privatizing the space station to move it to an international space station authority that was made up of uh, the international partners of aerospace companies or corporations rather than having NASA itself doing the operational work. With money saved from that, perhaps we could do a phase A study that would allow the next president, whoever he is in 2000, to have on his desk, these are your options for going to Mars. Well, the proposal that you're talking about, I am currently exploring in my office. There was a group that uh, came out of the Potomac Institute that put forward a proposal to set up a uh, commercial space corporation. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things in defense of NASA in regards to this whole issue of commercial space. Um, it's very unfair to ask a federal civil servant who works for the government to think in terms of commercial operations. And when they fail to do so and establish a commercial operation, to criticize them for having failed to, to achieve a commercial operation. That's why this idea of setting up a commercial space corporation uh, operating on a similar kind of model to some of the other government-run 
independent corporations uh, has, I think, a lot of potential. Uh, one of the things that I've been very concerned about in this issue, and I, and I mentioned this in my speech, on this issue of commercializing the station is there are a lot of people out there who want to do that, but if you look at their capital flow, in order for them to be able to keep the investors in the pipeline, they have to get time on the shelf over the next five years. One of the things that I have been critical of was the strategy that was developed by NASA to basically shut off all commercial opportunities on the shuttle for five years while we have uh, launching of the station payload and assembly. And then we're going to turn on the electricity up there in the space station and we're going to say, okay, let's commercialize it now. One of, and I mentioned this in the speech, one of the positive byproducts of the Russian failure to perform <coughs> may be the opportunity to keep some of these budding commercial operations uh, uh, viable so that they will be able to move into the station. The proposal that you were alluding to to take the profits from this commercial operation and put it into a new uh, line of budget that would be for Mars exploration, I think is a very exciting one. It's one that I'm discussing with members of the committee. Let me go over here and take a few questions from this side of the room. Gentlemen, Wayne, in back. If you look at the history of Western uh, expansion. The three primary characteristics was motivated by the one was government expenditure, Fernandez Bell. Uh, the other one was prizes, a reward if you can win and found them. And the third one was land grants, property to be gained. The Republican Congress would seem to be trying to promote development and exploration without disturbing the budget, would address the issue of land grants on Mars, land grants on the moon, property rights in orbit. Uh, that's the cheapest way to mobilize private. If there's no reason for me to invest a million dollars, I mean, I could find, you can finance a trip to the moon, program on the moon, if I had a way to get my money back. Without property rights, I don't. Why don't you address that issue? Can you address that issue? Well, uh, that has not been proposed to us up until now. Uh, obviously, there would be some significant international issues that you have to work through uh, and the Congress of the United States would start deeding property rights on the moon, for example. I would think that uh, our friends in Japan and Russia and Europe might start questioning uh, our right to do that. Uh, though I would argue that we would certainly have a fair amount of rights to do that and that we had uh, seven missions or six missions to the moon and we've got the flag on the moon. So that's a very innovative idea. Uh, I think there were some hands up up here. Buzz Aldrin, do you have your hand up? <laughs> 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 I, I was kind of wrestling with uh, the uh, allocation of our resources because I feel that in the year 2000,
Did everybody hear his comments? No. 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 Well, what he's talking about is, um, you know, we're going to have an election year in the year 2000. You know, we're going to swear in a new president in the year 2001. It's the beginning of a, not only a new century, it's a new millennium. And it would be, at least the way I read your comments, is it would be very, very good if supporters of space could uh, bring political pressure, friendly political pressure, uh, <laughs> on the debate so that as the candidates emerge, uh, it's very, very clear to them that this is a part of, of defining uh, the future of our nation. And it's a big part of defining uh, where we want to go as, as a people, where we want to go as a race, where we want to go as, as a world. Uh, and I think the timing is excellent. Uh, I think any uh, serious presidential contender would be willing to embrace future space exploration as a part of his platform or her platform. Because there is nothing that defines you more as a visionary and somebody that's looking to the future. And I can tell you that talking about Medicare and Social Security and, uh, and balancing the budget and those sort of things, you know, that, that doesn't really excite people. But when you start talking about going to Mars, going to the moon, probes to other stars, finding if there's other life in the universe, that really excites people all over the world. I think I need to wrap it up because you have another speaker coming up. Is that right? I think you're probably needed somewhere else here around the district. So yes. <laughs> I have to, that's right. I have to go. Today is Memorial Day, uh, which is a work day for a congressman. <laughs> I have to make several uh, veterans uh, meetings and speeches. But uh, I want to thank you. I'd love to stay and answer more questions. Uh, but it's really great to be here and see so many space enthusiasts joined together for the purpose of, of uh, advancing the cause of space. Thank you and God bless you.
Bridges uh, is a uh, uh, former resident or uh, uh, native of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so right next door, uh, Lord Floridians, uh, Georgia, we get along pretty well. Graduated from uh, high school in Georgia and is a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, earning a bachelor's degree in engineering science in 1965. He received a master's of science degree in astronautics from Purdue University. 1996. He's a recipient of several awards and honors, including recognition as a distinguished graduate of the U.S. Air Force Pilot Training and a top graduate of the U.S. Air Force Test Pilot School. He's a recipient of the Distinguished Service Medal, Medal Defense Superior Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, Legion of Merit with Oak Leaf Cluster, Distinguished Flying Cross, Meritorious Service Medal, Air Medal with 14 Oak Leaf Clusters, Air Force Accommodation Medal, NASA Space Flight Medal, and a NASA Certificate accommodation. I'd like you to join me in welcoming this morning to Roy Bridges, a very distinguished and important guest for this conference. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you for um, all coming this morning and staying for my uh, for a little chat about uh, getting out of uh, low Earth orbit. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be back at NASA. I've only uh, been back for a couple of months, and uh, because of that, I, I want to tell you that uh, I don't have all the answers today. Um, I've been off working on uh, national security issues for about uh, 10 years since I left uh, the <coughs> shuttle program in, in 1986. Uh, but what I do find on my return is a, um, a change uh, in basically our planning. I think uh, before, because of a long period of time between our, our last landing on the moon and when we were really seriously talking about the return of the moon on to Mars and beyond, which is the subject of my speech today, I think a lot of people got the impression that the space shuttle the space station were kind of a final destination. And I want you to know that nothing could have been further from the truth. <laughs> Would you put up the first slide? I uh, will say that uh, our administrator, Mr. Golden, uh, strongly favors uh, getting a, a mission to Mars and uh, making sure that we don't make that a final destination either. So those two words on the bottom part of this chart and beyond are very important. We live in a universe which is limitless, at least in our current knowledge of it. Why would we want to limit our exploration of a limitless universe? I don't know. It is a philosophy that is very similar to the flat earth philosophy earlier century, when people were kind of afraid to get close to the edge, so to speak. I find a few people at the Kennedy Space Center are flat earth people. Um, and all they're kind of stuck on the shuttle. But I would say by and large, over 90% of them are extremely excited about the fact that we are taking some bold steps, primarily in planning right now, to show how we can uh, break this gridlock we have and get on the that's really what I want to talk about today is how, what are we doing in our planning? I'd like to share with you the work in progress. I want to show you a road map that um, our center directors and NASA headquarters uh, started with a big meeting that we had on 8 and 9 May. Uh, we're using this as the basis for uh, building a detailed plan that we hope to roll out this year that will perhaps be the basis of something that Mr. Goldman can sell to the government and to the American people that will get us on down this road. So I've got just a few slides there. I've mainly stolen them from other people. In fact, some of you may have seen in this conference. Um, and uh, in some cases, I've even left the credit on the slides. Sometimes I've just blatantly stolen them, so I'll give a part of Next. Well, I took this one from the Global Surveyor, which is arriving in Mars in September of this year. Pathfinder arrives on the uh, 4th of July. It's our next robotic mission to Mars after a long absence. And I'd just like to talk to you a moment about Mars and why. Uh, there's a very intriguing uh, 
subject of exploration for many, many years, about half the size of Earth next. Uh, has some interesting characteristics, most of you are familiar with, a little less than a 25-hour day, about uh, two Earth years and one of theirs. Uh, lower mass gives us about 38% of uh, Earth gravity. It's a, a carbon dioxide atmosphere, which is kind of important. It's a resource, and I'll just mention that later on. Uh, you've got to really suck hard to breathe because it's like being out at about 100,000 feet here on Earth. Uh, temperature ranges from a balmy uh, 20 degrees C to very, very cold. Uh, so it's a challenging environment. It's a seasonal environment, as the recent Hubble photos have shown. Uh, uh, going from dust storms and pink skies that we've seen before with Viking to some blue skies with uh, uh, white clouds of uh, crystals. Next. It's a challenge to get to Mars. Uh, there have been a variety of ways we propose to do that to make it uh, it's less, less resource intensive. But frankly, as you'll notice there towards the bottom of this chart, that it's about 800 million miles, and depending on the trajectory you choose to, uh, to go there, it can range uh, from almost a year, um, as in this case. Uh, we're looking at, in our reference mission that we use for Mars in order to reduce the radiation exposure to humans, we're looking at uh, transit times of about 180 to 200 days. And uh, we're looking at surface stay times of around 500, 600 days. So if you add all that up, you're looking at mission duration of around 900 days down the two, two way. So it's a long mission, a very uh, ambitious, a very tough exploration mission. Uh, one that will be uh, very, very challenging, but potentially very, very rewarding. Particularly if we do it in such a way that, that we don't make it a uh, one shot or destination or just a demonstration. If we can set up a base there where we can go back until we get what we need from Mars or eventually perhaps even occupy permanently if that appears to be the right thing to do. Next. And this says a little bit about why. Uh, I would like to uh, just let you read the words on the chart because I would like to say that why is really <coughs> kind of goes back to the title slide. A lot of uh, a lot of our exploration could be summed up this way: There's nothing new under the sun. It's just that we've only recently heard about some of it. That is, that there are a lot of answers out there to very important questions if we were only smart enough to pose the right questions. There are a lot of things that we need to know in order to continue our civilization. For some reason, because we enjoy a high standard of living in this country, we somehow or another feel like that it's a guarantee that we will continue as a civilization. And I don't think there are any such guarantees. Without answers to some very profound questions and to continue seeking out uh, all the things that God has put in this wonderful universe for us to discover, we may not continue. And so that brings me to the uh, bottom line, which is if going to the moon and landing on the moon as an engineering demonstration was one of the things that was uh, most significant in the 20th century, I think most people remember where they were when the eagle landed, then what would be the most significant thing in the first half of the 21st century? And I dare say it might be that we found conclusive evidence there was life on some other body in the solar system. I think that would be something that most people would remember because it would be so profound in terms of the universe, the fact that life existed in a very small and insignificant solar system in a very small and insignificant galaxy would probably mean that life is abundant and diverse throughout the universe with profound implications forevermore. Next. I think there's a lot of evidence that, and you probably heard some of this in this conference, um, that we have only recently discovered a third branch of the tree of life here on Earth, despite the fact that we've been looking around for it for many centuries. And um, so, in, so in joining plants, uh, animals, humans, fungus, and bacteria, is this 
this other chain on the tree of life uh, made up of organisms which are fundamentally different. They don't breathe oxygen, they don't use photosynthesis, they exist in extreme environments, 200 atmospheres uh, in the deepest spots of the ocean at temperatures of over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And we've only recently discovered them, and yet the uh, genetic structure is about 50% common with the other uh, uh, organisms on the three branches of the tree, indicating that there was a common ancestor. There's considerable evidence in fossils that life existed on the Earth much earlier in our uh, evolution than ever known before. Now, all of these things together tell us that perhaps life existed on other uh, planets in our solar system uh, earlier in the formative years when perhaps it was not so cold and so um, uh, difficult for life to continue. That's why. There's a lot of debate about the meteorite from Mars and whether or not it was conclusive that there, were, there was a life there. But certainly, uh, it's intriguing. And um, wow, could we ever expect to be so lucky as to have a piece of Mars knocked off the planet on Earth that would give us all the answers here? I mean, that would be, that would be like winning the lottery. And I don't think we're going to get it so easy. We're probably going to have to go look. Because just as we have found here on Earth, finding some of the life that is different from yeah. us means you have to dig deep. You have to go to the coldest, driest spot on Earth. And you have to look at some places where you never thought to look before. So this is why probably humans are going to have to go to Mars to guide this exploration. We're going to have to use our intellect, and it's probably going to be um, uh, used in real time in order to guide the exploration to make sure we look in the right spots. It's quite likely life on Mars retreated deep in order to escape the invading cold uh, millions of years ago when I had to look for it. Thanks. Well, okay, this summer, 4th of July, we're going to land this little guy. It's about a 25 pound rover. And, uh, you know, it's not much in the big scheme of things, but we're back. And uh, it, it shows faster, better, cheaper, and I hope it, um, I hope it uh, does some good work there. Because a balance between the robotic and human mission is very important. But it's a, it's a big jump to go from a 25-pound rover to the next, this uh, reference mission, next slide, of a habitat on Mars which is a habitat module and a lab module with a rover that's capable of several hundred kilometers of exploration. And this requires a substantial investment and uh, many years of sustained uh, program in order to, to get there. Now, we can't do this unless the American people in the Congress are going to be behind us for 10 or 15 years in duration which would span several administrations, and it's quite a challenge in our political structure. Next. It's important that we do some um, things that might have been considered very risky. You don't need to read all the words on this because the chart is really to illustrate that in our reference mission, we are sending the ascent vehicle for the return flight with empty propellant tanks, and we intend to um, make the propellant while we're on the surface of Mars. Now obviously, you know, we're going to make sure this works before the first humans arrive. It's something they'd like to know. But nevertheless, it is a big change in how we think about uh, exploring uh, the, the uh, planets and how uh, we have to develop some, uh, um, uh, you might say, automated plants that will go and do our work for us and, and that we will find reliable enough to trust our lives with. Thanks. Well, this is not all we're doing in terms of exploration. There are a lot of places that humans cannot go in the foreseeable future. Saturn is a place like that. And of course, we're sending the Cassini mission there this October. It's currently being uh, put together and going through its final test processes at the Cape today. Uh, we plan to launch it on the 6th of October. It will arrive in the Saturn system about 2004. Next slide. It'll uh, do an extensive uh, exploration there, including sending a probe down into the atmosphere of um, a 
very intriguing moon, Titan, uh, which has an atmosphere which may have been very much like an early Earth atmosphere. Much colder, of course, but uh, nevertheless quite intriguing. Excellent. Of course, Galileo's at Jupiter now, sending back some neat stuff. You see a couple of the moons there, the Europa and the uh, near the middle of this photograph. Next slide. Europa is very interesting. Uh, because it has uh, uh, a, uh, a formative environment that separated out the elements, one of those elements being ice or water perhaps. It has a molten uh, metallic core. Well, it has a metallic core, I don't know about molten. Uh, but it does have uh, a magnetic field, which uh, indicates uh, what I just said previously. And uh, perhaps uh, suggest some evidence of an internal heat source, probably because of uh, tidal action of Jupiter, that would keep um, at least part of this uh, water warm enough to support life. Now, it's going to be difficult for humans to get there because of the uh, radiation uh, belts around Jupiter. And this would be a very, very challenging robotic mission to go there and uh, find out whether or not there's life. Next. Okay, on 8 and 9 May, when we got together to do our Mars planning, uh, this is a roadmap that we use. Very difficult for you to read. I'd like for you just to concentrate on the le leftmost column, because that's really uh, some of the things I'd like to talk about in the rest of this uh, speech. I'd like to tie together a few things and show you how they relate to uh, eventually getting to uh, our near-term goal of human mission to Mars, let's say out in the 2015 time frame, uh, which is quite a challenging date, by the way, if you see some of the uh, lead-ups uh, that get to that. It would involve uh, perhaps a human lunar mission about 2007, where we would check out a lot of the equipment. And if there were some kind of commercial opportunity on the moon, that would be very synergistic, uh, Congressman Weldon talking some interesting ideas in that regard. I want to talk next about the space station. Um, I want to talk about it in terms of uh, what it means to NASA. I want to talk about how it relates to North Mars. Uh, you can see here we're going to need it to answer some uh, questions about long duration space flight and microgravity, about radiation effects and, and countermeasures for both of these. So speed into the next slide, which talks about really advanced life. Oh, no, no, put it back on there. Let me just uh, give you another few more uh, words of reading here. Advanced life support is the next slide, and how we use those countermeasures uh, in going to Mars. The middle line there, of course, are the robotic human missions uh, leading up to a, a lunar and Mars landing. Uh, we have conceived a uh, joint mission with our space science P-01. Uh, to demonstrate a number of the technologies on the surface of Mars that we would need um, uh, to use for our weapons mission. Space shuttle uh, upgrades are very important because they are uh, important to getting the station built. They are important for heavy lift and for human lift between now and 2015. They're very, very important. And, um, Something like a liquid flyback booster that you see out to the right, which I'll talk a little bit more about, can be a stepping stone to a heavy lift vehicle that will put big chunks in low Earth orbit that we would need to go back to the moon and Mars. Uh, in situ resource uh, utilization is something that uh, our people at Kennedy are very interested in. We have a lot of experts in cryogenic, uh, fuel storage, uh, monitoring, and utilization. And I think we can add a lot to developing this technology, uh, particularly the applied technology portion of this. And finally, the last line says we do need some work in uh, advanced propulsion systems uh, to get out of the lower orbit to Mars uh, in an efficient way so we don't have to have such big chunks in low Earth orbit to go and come. Because dollars per pound is what it's all about. And that's, that's true when we're talking about getting to low Earth orbit as well as getting from the Earth orbit to uh, back to the moon and Mars. So 
I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of these, primarily the station and the shuttle upgrades and how they relate to the Mars mission. Next. Okay, the International Space Station. Some of you would like to debate this, perhaps, about how important it is. Fact, we are building, okay? <laughs>
by about 2,000 people, get the overtime down, show them we have our processes under control and we understand this technology. Next. We've kind of picked all the uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of reducing the cost as much as we can. Over a third reduction since we turned the flight. Next. Safety is good, measured in terms of uh, incidents that we see. Of course, um, this, for this kind of a mission, you'd like to be perfect, so we're not happy with this. We can be a lot safer with the shuttle. Next. Any future uh, gains are likely to be very tough given we picked the low hanging fruit. If you look at the upper left, that's an op orbiter processing facility where we spend most of our time uh, in between launches. And our best flow to date is 52 days there. Now, I'm going to show you why we need some shuttle upgrades if we want to reduce that. And that is the big target. If you look at the other ones, it's a fairly low number of days. Next. And we need to do that and get our flight rate up because dollars per pound to orbit, uh, which you see there, 96 being uh, around $15,000 per pound uh, to the space station, around $10,000 per pound to lower orbit. If you want to cut that substantially, it's a big factor of launch rate. You can't do faster launch rates unless you change your processes if you want to do it safely. Next. This kind of sums it all up. If we'd like, as in terms of goal, to see our flight rate double, reduce our, our uh, turnaround time by half so we can get the dollars per pound to orbit way down for our human lift and our heavy lift launch vehicle, and also double, let's say, make the safety go up by a factor of four or five, then those things on the bottom represent the shuttle upgrade phase one, two, three, and four that we need to invest in. Next. This is uh, what the folks at KSC looked at, and you can just kind of read the two uh, red lines here. Right now, it takes about 130 shifts of 13 weeks in the orbit processing facility. With some fairly focused upgrades, we think we can get that down to 30, 44 shifts, or cut it by two thirds. And we do that, next slide, primarily by if you'll focus on the upper left, by taking our current hypergolic uh, orbital maneuvering system and attitude control system engines and making those non-toxic propellants, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. If we could also uh, take our uh, lower middle there, our flight control surfaces, if they were uh, run by electric actuators so we could get rid of our hydraulic systems and the hydrogen that powers them. That would get rid of all of our toxic fuels. And it substantially reduces the labor and the turnaround time in every flow. And that's why this becomes, the, you might say, the centerpiece of our shuttle upgrade program that we're focused on. There are other things on the slide that we're also doing that are helpful. But those are the two big pieces of reducing our flow. And we're all studying those now. Frankly, we're not moving fast enough for many of us. Uh, but like everything with the shuttle, everybody takes a fairly conservative bend because we do have so much riding on it. But we're hopeful over the next couple of years to bring in uh, at least these two big shuttle upgrades. Next. The other big one is a liquid flyback booster to replace our solid rockets. Now, the liquid flyback booster is important because it gives us a freedom uh, from an abort back to the launch site with an engine out off the pad. And that by itself makes us a lot safer. It is much more robust technology using engines that are throttled way back and have large margins. It gives us an ability to up the payload to the very upper limits of what the shuttle can carry. And potentially with some unmanned upper stage payload carriers would be a stepping stone to the kind of lift capability that we need to go back to the moon and Mars. Next, this is what it looks like rolling out of the uh, current uh, vehicle assembly building. A uh, little uh, touch up of some photography. <laughs> it's amazing, you can't believe anything anymore because we really don't have these yet. I wish we had this stage. 
because what a boom it would be in terms of dollars per pound to orbit. Now, next slide. You might wonder, well, how does this fit in with uh, X33s in the next slide, uh, X34s, which I assume, I'm going to assume that you know a lot about, which are potentially single stage to orbit technology and also are potentially the lowest cost way to get to orbit and has the most flexibility operation, etc. Well, how does this relate to upgrading the shuttle with a reusable liquid flyback booster? Does this compete? I mean, what, what's going on here? Well, the bottom line is this. We are working with industry, and these are partnership with industry, to try to get the single stage orbit technologies in a place where they can be commercially successful. Because that is the way to go. But this is a very challenging technology and very low margin in terms of what you have to do to the vehicle uh, performance wise in order to have a useful payload in orbit. It will be probably a number of years before we'll be able to lift big payloads with this kind of technology. So this is not a player in terms of us getting to Mars. It is perhaps a player if we're successful with the technology in reducing the uh, dollars per pound uh, getting to orbit for smaller payloads uh, and, and giving a, a boost to the commercial launch industry. It does not compete with a shuttle in terms of heavy lift or large numbers of humans to orbit. I just want you to understand that. So if you hear arguments about that, I'm telling you, it's mostly hot air, okay? We need to pursue both of these. And the best thing to do is, if you look at the shuttle, we have a bomb the shuttle concept, which right now is a two-stage, partially reusable vehicle. With liquid flyback boosters, it would be a two-stage, fully reusable vehicle with fairly, uh, 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 you might say, uh, technology that is here and now with low margins once we have the low, I mean with big margins in terms of safety once we have this liquid flyback booster. So uh, it's really not competitive and uh, we need to pursue both of them. It's a good parallel track to be on. We're going to use the X-34 to simulate a liquid flyback booster coming back into the Cape. It'll be kind of a pathfinder. We'll also demonstrate a number of other technologies that we want to put on the show, like a, a additional vehicle health monitoring systems. Next. Okay, I want to just finish up with a, just a couple of slides uh, talking about some foundational issues. One of them has to do with international cooperation in terms of space exploration, given that we're in a global economy that is very competitive, where national economies are competing, and it's very, very difficult to sort all this out. And I, I would just say fundamentally that uh, when we get together to do some big things in terms of uh, exploration, I think that's required. I think, that, I think the world has to work together to do that because they are so expensive. And, and frankly, a lot of nations want to be involved. Together, we can do a lot more than we could singly compete with each other. And how does that relate to global economic competition? <coughs> I think really what is the focus on is making the size of the glass bigger rather than what share of the glass we get of the same size glass. And really, that's what we need to be focused on is making the global economy bigger so that more people share in a high standard of living. And I think that's exactly what a focused investment in space exploration will do. Next. You know, people talk about that in terms of spinoffs. And we've got some little kind of baseball, or we call them meatball cards, we'll pass out to you on the latest on NASA spinoffs. We've had, I would say, um, not tremendous success in selling this concept. In fact, I met with the editorial board of the Orlando Sentinel the other day, and the only thing they could remember in terms of spinoffs from the moon was Tang. 
<laughs> now, I'm sure they said that as a joke, but the point is, is that the average guy on the street does not really relate to spinoff. And we have to do an immense amount of work to sell this idea. The fact is that spinoffs do create jobs. And here's an example that we work with Ames and use some fairly uh, innovative software, and so I would put it in the class of you know, industrial engineering software to schedule very complex projects. And believe it or not, this is where the Boeings and McDonnell Douglases of the world do not seem to have a clue. They cannot produce a look ahead schedule that shows how to build something like the International Space Station because we've had to send our people out to help them figure this out. And here's a product that we have successfully uh, commercialized uh, to get this kind of software on the market next. The other concept I'd like to talk about is the impact on our youth of a space, a space exploration initiative. I don't think that we can expand the global economy or keep our own economy healthy without increased attention on motivating people to do the hard work it takes to pursue a math science or engineering education, it is hard work, okay? Now, if you're mentally challenged like I am, it takes a lot of late night study in order to do things. If you like Buzz Aldrin here, you know, he probably got it right in through school. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to work in it. And in fact, uh, the kind of work that Buzz Aldrin and, and people in the space program at the time were doing, in the 60s motivated me to do the extra work that it took to get through engineering school. And I think the same thing is true today. You need to have a pull uh, for these folks to help them um, put in long hours and, and, and all the, to get through school. Now, there is a uh, national competition sponsored by a uh, organization called FIRST for inspiration and recognition of science and technology that has a national competition of uh, high school students to produce robots. Next slide. And they compete here at Epcot. They did so here uh, a couple of weeks ago in a competition of their robots to uh, go through some kind of a task. In this case, it was picking up one or two like things and putting them on some posts. And uh, three of these devices competed one time and uh, you have to pick a strategy. You know, do you want to destroy the other machine first before you pick things up? Do you want to use height, which is uh, one of the machines there is very high? So you pick a strategy. You uh, have a, a project management team. You get a, a parts list and a box full of parts that you have to use. And you get six weeks to build your competitor and uh, get ready to uh, enter the arena. There are regional competitions and then there's a national competition. Our KSC team placed first in NASA of all the NASA center sponsored teams and was 14 out of 156 nationwide. And I'd like to just take a bow on behalf of our people. <laughs> but the kids get all charged up about this because it is done kind of like sports. There were even cheerleaders here, cheering on the teams. And uh, they, they, they really enjoyed doing something that was very high tech and was very motivating and shows them, uh, practically speaking, uh, what uh, engineers do for a living. And I would like to uh, just um, say that I think this first competition is something that we uh, ought to hold up as a model and that we ought to be doing a lot more of it around the country. And if it had as much support as your local football team, our economy would probably be a lot better off. Kind of amazing. <laughs> the big government supported, nationally supported engineering projects like, next slide, uh, back to the moon, Mars and beyond do help inspire people. And uh, so I am stronger behind this. I want you to know that the 
NASA is strongly behind a strong exploration program, and that uh, all of us at the Kennedy Space Center, rather than being sad that we might commercialize the shuttle, are sad that we might commercialize the space station, are in fact excited that it's time to move on to the next interim destination on our exploration trail. Thank you very much.
And, I, and I'll tell you why, because you're going into facilities where there are hazardous operations ongoing. If you want to take this 13-week turnaround and jump it up about double so that we can run a more extensive tour operation, you know, I will probably last about two or three weeks out there before I get fired, okay? <laughs> so we've got to find the right balance here, and the right balance is we do lots of touring for small groups, and we have big groups that do the best we can. landing 
at a fairly remote site, usually over oceans and not jeopardize many people. So you've got to be able to take control of these things and take responsibility for them and keep them from landing in populated areas. And once once we have some assurances on that count, I, I think we could probably uh, work out a deal, particularly if we had something like a little club at this where you could get a little bit more into it. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. Buzz. Uh, 
uh, over time, okay? And people are, are playing with that idea, and part of this planning session we had in early May was to look at this kind of out-of-box thinking and, and, and look at what, how industry might respond to that, and we'll see where we go, okay? But I'm, I am, uh, I resonate with this. I'd like to do something much more dramatic if you really feel like the shuttle will be privatized in the long run. Because I think with a vehicle like this, it would have a, a high probability to be a commercial success. And then if it worked out, we could upgrade the other free vehicles if we need them all, and uh, could also put those into the commercial fleet after the station was done, and then NASA would be totally out of ops, and we would just buy flights as you need. And that's kind of the proposal. Thank <laughs> you. 